Hello, welcome you all to this uh, today's program. And this is a series. Today, January 11th, uh, to, is uh, from around 6.30. Again, next month, February 22nd, climate change as it affects land resources. Then March 8th, climate change and the air resources. At the end, at last but not the least, on Earth Day, Saturday, we are going to have a special edition on climate change around 10 o'clock, 10.30 a.m. in the morning. Okay, uh, welcome you all again. And uh, I would like to introduce uh, Gerald Haspatcher. And uh, he is the co-chair of the Sierra Club, Southeast Michigan. The first in the series is uh, climate change and water resources. It will focus on water quality. He is going to talk about on climate change. Mr. Haspatcher will approach local water quality issues through a global lens. This presentation will help attendees better understand local water resources in a changing climate. Thank you all again. Uh, I would like to welcome Mr. Haspatcher. Yes. And, uh, Thank you. Um, so besides being the co-chair of the Southeast Michigan Group, well, I think I should explain that. And I guess I have to stay about right here that the Sierra Club has a small paid staff. So it's not that big. They really depend a lot on volunteers. And so there are five different groups um, that are not employees. And um, this is a Southeast Michigan Group. And there's another one uh, in uh, Ann Arbor called the uh, Huron Valley Group. So um, my Southeast Michigan group is Wayne, Macomb, Oakland, and St. Clair County. And pretty much that gives me a chance to get my fingers in anything I want to. So I can always use that for excuse, you know. Um, so I'm also the chair of the Green Cruise. I think we did our, our 17th is coming up. It's the week before the Dream Cruise. And we have two rides at 8 a.m., which is 40, 40 miles, and at 9 a.m., which is 22. So um, 22 is a great ride if you ever want to come. Uh, and then I also am uh, working with a group trying to make Belle Isle a form of Dark Sky Park and change the lighting on the island and try to get everybody else in on with it. So um, I mean, let's get going. Here it's all about using too much energy from non-renewable resources, which creates greenhouse gases that's causing our planet to change. And that's what it's all about right there. It's using fossil fuels and using too much of them. So, um, and my brother, I was on the phone yesterday. He said, now make sure you say something that's positive. And which when you're talking about climate change, it's sort of hard to do. So he sent me this article about the ozone hole and it should be healing by 2040. Thank you, Jim. And in fact, Jim is a gardener. And of course, that's one of the things that we promote uh, as being green and uh, particularly native plants because native plants have those long root systems. And we'll find out later that anything that we can do to keep water out of the sewer system is going to help with the quality of our water. And he made a new raised bed just for his asparagus yesterday. Now, going on to my sister, I know I don't have that many family members, so this will end. But my sister sent me a few too, and she lives in uh, Montmorency County in Maryland, and uh, specifically in her uh, town, Gaithersburg, is very progressive. And they have proposed a ban on gas powered leaf blowers. So I won't have you raise your hand, but um, to me, it's like dueling leaf blowers. And you hear them and they're actually, you, you can tell how polluting they are if you're close to them because how much they smell. Also in Maryland, um, East Coast first countywide gas ban passed in Maryland. Um, we'll be talking about that. In fact, there was an NPR segment yesterday about uh, gas burning stoves. And they talked about um, the, uh, particularly the nitrous oxides that's given off. And they found that um, with houses that have gas burning stoves, they have a 40% more chance of the kids having asthma 
So they can get asthma more from that and aggravate them if they do have that. So, and they're uh, banning the international release of balloons in Mount Renzi County. That's my sister's county again. And it's interesting that I was up north at a cabin on Lake Michigan, and I was walking along the shore, picking up the debris. Guess what I was picking up? Ribbons. Yeah, ribbons. I don't know what happened to the balloons. This is the ribbons were left. Whatever happened to the balloons, I'm not sure. So it does affect us too. That would be sort of nice to have that. And uh, a ban on styrofoam. Of course, styrofoam is the trade name. And um, then I had, it says the National Toxicology Program concludes that styrene is reasonably anticipated to be a human carcinogen based on induced cancers, genotoxicity, and mechanism. So what I've always said is that if the food gets in the styrofoam, the styrofoam is probably getting in the food. So, uh, and I've talked to some, a couple of restaurants. One said it was too expensive compared to styrofoam. And the other one said, oh no, the food will melt the plastic, which is not true. So I sort of gave up on that. And, um, but uh, I will say that if you are going to take carryouts home, I would transfer them right away to something other than that. And all more on the good news list is we have a list of companies that are being very environmental. We have ones here that have made the 2022 climate change A-list in the middle, uh, made the 2022 forest A-list, and on the right made the 2022 water security A-list. And that's from looking at 15,000 companies. Does that tell us something? They got 400 or 15,000, but anyways, they're trying. Uh, another thing about that is that we're having uh, we're going to have a much easier time keeping track of who is polluting what. Uh, they just um, put a satellite up, and I think it was it for well, the latest one was actually to map the oceans. But they have satellites now to uh, track refrigerants and methane, so it's a little easier. And they even have a group that's going to try to review all the companies in the United States to try to kill. Uh, keep them accountable. So um, we'll talk about the basics of climate change, and I'll do my best here to make this interesting. But I don't know if you about know about the announcement on uh, December 5th, and it was about fusion energy. And so what does this actually hold? It holds the possibility of limitless energy. Uh, the question is, is that would it come in time? to uh, solve some of our problems is they're going to be a little late. For certain, one of the, two of the problems it's not going to solve is it's not going to make the ocean level go down. But once it's melted, how do you refreeze it? <laughs> you just can't make it to the average. You're going to have to go below the average. And of course, we don't want to do that. And the other one, hmm, uh, oh, biodiversity. So they have just to finish a uh, United Nations Biodiversity Conference, which I didn't even know happened, COP15, Conference of the Parties 15. So it's a 15 conference on biodiversity. And then of course, those animals are not going to be able to come back if they go extinct. So um, the, uh, there are actually more than two dozen different um, prototypes, not prototypes, but experiments to the 20 more than 24 places where they were trying to make this fusion. And about nine months ago, there was an announcement from China that they had made a um, reaction and it was at 124 million degrees Celsius in China and it had gone on for 17 minutes, which was really something. It was really it was a great strike. I do not think, though, that that reaction made more energy than it took to make the reaction, whereas the one that happened at Livermore, California, which is Livermore, uh, let's see, the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory did make more energy than it used. And not only that, it only burnt 4% of the fuel. So it might give you an idea of what the potential is. But anyways, it says on December 5th, 192 lasers, and 
I'm assuming that maybe those are the lasers. You see some people right here. Um, 192 lasers at the National Ignition Facility converged on a small gold cylinder that contained a tiny bead of fuel composed of two isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium and tritium. In, the flat, in a flash, the cylinder vaporized, emitting X-rays that bombarded the fuel pellet, turning its outer diamond layer into an expanding plasma that compressed the fuel inside to the point where its nuclei fused and released a tremendous amount of energy. So there were some other quite interesting statistics about this. Um, one of them is that it was the world's largest and most energetic laser system. And it heated the fuel pellet to 150 million degrees Celsius, which is 10 times the temperature of the sun and compressed it with a pressure over twice that's found at the sun's center. So really this was something that was extraordinary for sure. Um, so going on here, let's see if I can get this video going. And this is the temperature from 1880, which generally we talk about the beginning of the um, industrial revolution until the present. And well, in the late 1880s, 1880, that was the end of the mini ice age, and we're coming out of that now. That's why we're warming up. Until recently, where there's been no real temperature going up, actually, global warming would be a good thing. Excuse me. Uh, and so at the end here, if you notice that most of the warming is up in the upper regions. So um, I think we'll come across that. That would be pretty interesting. Thank you for that information very much, by the way. Um, so there are natural and man-made, um, let me say, things that generate changes in the temperature. And the ones that are natural, um, some of them are the Malkovich cycles. And I have a point in here somewhere. And we have the orbital, orbital eccentricity and the tilt, and then we have the precession. And altogether, they make uh, some cycles that happen on a regular basis with the climate. So this isn't a temperature chart. This is a carbon dioxide chart. So it looks as though we have a cycle of about 100,000 years. And I think about 1880 being down here because with less, less carbon dioxide, it would be colder. But uh, you can see that when we came along, suddenly this is going up. So um, the average for the last 800, excuse me, sir, you, uh, you need to put your hand up. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I have to go continue. I can't be taking comments all the time. Thank you. Maybe a second time, we'll do it again, okay? So sure. I put your hand up maybe one more time. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so uh, so basically the average is about 250. And when the chart was made, it was about 395 and we're up to 419. So the goal that was set at the Paris Agreement was 350 and we've heard a lot about 350. This is a chart not of 800,000 years, but of 600 million years. And we can see what the parts per million were at various times when extinctions happen. And if you follow this along, you can see right here, it says near future extinction, question mark. And even this one looks like it happened maybe around 800. And at the rate we're going, I mean, we have to wonder about, we're gonna get there now. Speaking of current extinctions, there's a lot of talk about a insect extinction, extinction, which is now I'm going to miss. Is there information on this elsewhere that you can find out like what location on the world, on, in the earth that they took all this information to do carbon dating and all that? Like, well, I mean, there's- Like where, where they went to get 
yeah, gather the material to get this. Information. Well, I think you can take any any question that you have and just write right. it in on Google, and it should come up with something for you. Okay. So yes, I'm on there all the time, just like you will be if you start looking. Okay, so the insect uh, extinction and um, so I wanted to point out a few of the uh, conference of the parties from the past. Uh, we probably all know about the Kyoto Protocol. Do you remember hearing about that one? This was a long time ago, um, but in 2015 was the um, Paris Agreement, and what was different about the Paris Agreement was that instead of these parties coming and they're telling them, this is what you have to do, they said, okay, you bring us your plan, and that meant that the countries were more invested in it. So at that uh, conference then was when they established the goal of not trying to let the temperature rise more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. Then um, they just had one in 2021, the Glasgow Agreement, COP26. And what was unusual about that is leading up to these conferences, they have a panel of scientists. It's called the International Panel on Climate Change, which puts together all the information. And then they hand it to, to the actual conference and the conference decides what's to use that out of that information. Well, guess what? The scientists got tired of them watering down their information. So they leaked it out. And then you may have seen uh, a um, headline called Code Red for Humanity. Or you may not have because of the two major newspapers in the Detroit area, it, it was shown one day, one day they showed that. So we're not getting a lot of information. Yet. And then they just had the Egyptian agreement which is uh, unique because what the people are doing is they're asking the people who have caused the climate change to start paying for it. Yes. Excuse me, sorry to interrupt you. If you have any questions, please write it down. And at the end of the program, he presentation, he is going to take all your questions. Please, uh, I think you respect our request. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Uma. Okay, so that was different about that one too. So which country do you think has been historically and is at present? Uh, well, not exactly. You know, maybe there's a couple front here. This, these have to do with, um, with oil producing countries that are burning off methane. But the United States is right here. And on average, each citizen used 14.4 tons of Coal, I think they make that coal. I'm not sure. Actually, you CO2 emissions, 14.4 uh, tons of, of CO2 emissions per year. So you can see right here, China, 7.2. And then about halfway, these people right here. I think one of the things to find, to look to discover about this chart is that if there are bad effects for us, they're affecting everybody, right? And so that means wildfires. Pakistan was one third underwater. And Pakistan is not even on this chart right here. So we've been a pretty big culprit. Okay, um, the basics of climate change. This is uh, talks about greenhouse gases. And uh, so, of course, Radiation comes in and the greenhouse gas blasts, gases keeps it from going out. Um, one interesting thing about this is that it's at night when the heat usually radiates out into space and it is not radiating out because of it's getting caught here. So the nighttime temperatures are going up more um, relative than daytime temperatures. So let's take a look a little bit at some of the greenhouse gases. Now I need to flip the page here. It's 97%. Okay. Yes. You know what? You know what? I think we're going to have somebody. 
Yes, we do. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, I think I'm up to it. Okay, so yes, uh, water vapor was about 97%, and you would think that this would be steady and it wouldn't make a big difference uh, about climate change, but the problem is, is that the way we use the other fossil fuels, we wind up <laughs> making the temperature higher, and then because the atmosphere is warmer, you have evaporation off the land, off the streams, off the rivers, and off the ocean. The very unfortunate part is when you evaporate the land, you're causing droughts. And when those people arrive, sometimes at our, board, at our border, they're arriving from Central America because they have to leave. They can't support themselves. Now, there's a lot of people still in the world that have to walk out their back door and be able to walk to get food. So it's a pity that uh, we don't seem to take this into, um, into account. So um, besides our greenhouse gases, just the fact that we're putting more water vapor into the atmosphere means that it's going to, there's a, a positive feedback system. So it's not just the greenhouse gases that we're putting in there, it's that the hot air has this feedback system. And there's a couple more I'm going to talk about too. So one of the things that um, it's causing is ice and snow and glaciers to melt. And this gives you some idea of the potential of Antarctica right here, which is one and a half times the size of the United States. And in particular, the problems are the shelves. So these ice shelves right here have no land underneath. So here's an ice shelf right here. And I think there's another one. Oh, let's see. Another one right here. This one is bigger than California. This one is bigger than California. So there's no land underneath. It's supported by the ice around it. And it has warming temperatures above, and it has a warming sea below. Another thing to point out back on this one right here is you see statistics of what would happen if certain percentages of Greenland would melt. And the first time I actually heard the term zombie ice. So zombie ice is ice that is going to go. We're on our way. There's no way to keep it from melting. So you can see a lot of statistics about Greenland just itself. So what is that warming doing when it's getting to the uh, Arctic? And if you took a look at that first video at the very end, it was all red up on top. So as it warmed then, right here, the polar vortex, and uh, another thing that happens when the oceans warm up, the lakes warm up in the streams, and warm water does not carry as much oxygen as um, cold water. And in fact, we used to have some uh, trout streams around here. There was only one left, that was a paint creek. I'm not sure we still have trout in it or not. So we have fewer fish, smaller fish, and then of course, times where we have die out, and I can probably maximize this and two. So we're going on to carbon dioxide. Um, I'm, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, one, two, three. Okay, here we go. Uh, so the carbon dioxide then of course that we put in the atmosphere comes into balance with uh, the ocean. And what happens is that the carbon dioxide then reacts with uh, water to form a weak acid called carbonic acid. And the acid keeps the shells that fish need, I'm um, fish that the shells that all this, a lot of creatures need from, uh, well, I'm really close to it. But anyway, uh, another thing about that is that there are, uh, Deposits of calcium carbonate on the bottom of the ocean. And the fact that we have thousands of feet of calcium carbonate under Michigan, too, because at one time this was an ocean. And should that carbon dioxide start reacting with the 
uh, calcium carbonate in the ocean, then we're gonna have champagne instead of an ocean. Okay, uh, I think we're going on to methane. And uh, methane, of course, many of us use this, we already mentioned in your stove and in eating in the house. And so around the country, um, as with my sister's county, they're trying to get people to use less methane. So it leaks from the site where it's uh, being drilled and it leaks into the container or however they get it by truck or by pipe to the, um, the uh, refinery. And then of course it has to have pipes eventually that come to all your houses and then with the potential for a leak there. So you may already know that they have to put something in methane to make it smell because it's odorless. So it's, uh, there's a longer name for it, but generally called mercaptan and methyl mercaptan. So it smells like rotten eggs. And if you smell that before, like when you're walking along the street, sometimes you smell it because you're passing a leak. I know biking, I smell it. I know people who have trouble growing some grass in certain spots and they just can't figure it out. And so sometimes it's that kind of a leak. Um, so um, there's some examples of leaks here that you can't see, but with the right kind of camera, you could see the methane leaking. Um, and it says, we, well, I guess I can't read it. When methane escapes into the air, it acts as a potent greenhouse gas. We know that already. It's about 72 times as uh, potent as carbon dioxide. And the owner of this site has filed for bankruptcy. We tried to alert the company to this and no one called back. So there we are tightening the rules in the US for emissions of methane. And they actually are making a priority of methane over carbon dioxide because it has a shorter life. And I'm not sure I've got that ex explanation totally in my head but um, they are rewriting the rules with methane. Another release of methane um, would happen from the ocean floor and the Arctic Ocean is a shallow one. And as it warms up then, the methane would escape up. And another reason why it's warming is because the ice is melting, melting and you don't have the albedo effect of having the radiation uh, reflected back out into space. Um, also there's thawing permafrost, which holds a lot of carbon dioxide in it too, and methane. Uh, and not only is it coming from the ocean and specifically more from the Arctic Ocean, but in Siberia, they have what they call mega slumps. So you can see the people standing outside there, and these are just eruptions of methane that are coming out. Uh, besides the water vapor loop, loop and the methane loop, there would be a wildfire loop. So when you have a wildfire, the tree releases all the carbon dioxide that it stored, and it's not there to take up the carbon dioxide that were, it had been before. So these wildfires then are contributing quite a bit to the warming that we're seeing. Uh, next one, nitrous oxide, we talked a little bit. Um, it's also uh, our agricultural um, and because it's got nitrate in there and uh, industrial purposes, but it's also from transportation and from, from um, even your stove. Okay, uh, the next one that I had on the list is the F gases, fluorinated gases. And they have a high global warming potential. And it can be in the thousands. And here's some examples right here. So I was at my brother's house who had a heat pump all these years. And he had the guy over to um, check his heat pump. I guess it was just a scheduled maintenance. And I cornered this guy and started talking to him. And it was very interesting. And I specifically asked him about what gas they're using as a refrigerant. And he said, really, they have gases now that are hardly global warming at all, which is what it says right here on the right side, global warming potential. 
And he didn't understand why they didn't start using them. So this is this kind of inertia where we just want to keep doing what we've been doing in the past. I had to put this one in. Yes. This one's another source of methane limestone. Limestone? Limestone. Oh, yeah. limestone. Oh, definitely. Yeah. For certain. Yeah. Um, so I had to take this. I wish I could make some more comments about that, but I'm not, I don't think I can at this moment. Um, I took this picture at a local park and I think it just doesn't have anything to do with methane, but it does have to do with wasting energy because you have an ice uh, container here that's staying outside all summer and, and also keeping the uh, pop cool. So I think the parks could do a little bit more. Okay, uh, we're gonna get off the um, climate change and get into some local issues. And this is a map of the Clinton River watershed. And if you look at the map, notice that there are no straight lines. Well, right, they put them all in a pipe, right? Uh, and I put these cities around here just to show you how large this is. And then I noticed another thing yesterday too, that the, this right here is where the red run daylights. Have you been on De Quinn here where you see the red run on the side and you see nothing on the other side? So that's where the sewage from the 12 towns goes across and into the Red Run. So we in Macomb County don't mind pointing our finger at the 12 towns uh, because they can't, uh, because we don't send them anything bad. We make our own bad stuff, but actually they're putting about one and a half billion gallons of partially treated sewage each year into the Red Run. So there is, not a problem with the lake. The problem is what we put in it. So what would we would ideally have would be a separate sewer system, a separated sewer system. The next one's going to stay combined so that all the water off the roof and the lawn and the street then it goes into the lake and any of the waste from a house goes into stormwater sewer and to the sewage treatment plant. In fact, uh, we have combined systems. Um, we're more, more separated than we are combined, but we still have combined systems and we'll see them on the next map. Uh, for instance, in the city of Detroit, uh, it would cost trillions of dollars to dig up every sewer line and separate it. So that's not going to work. And the, pretty much the problem for Detroit is the same, I'm sorry, pretty much the solution for Detroit is the same as for Macomb County, and that's green infrastructure. And part of that is getting everyone to try to keep water out of the sewer system for as long as they can. Now with businesses, they may have them have a, um, you know, word's not coming to my to my head, but it's underneath the parking lot that holds the water until the storm is over and then it drains. So um, if we were to get involved ourselves right here, we would, if your downspout was still connected here to your footing, you would unconnect that. I think that's really old houses, right? Yes, I think so. Um, you would redirect the eaves and make sure that they don't go straight down the driveway. Uh, try to get them to get in the grass a little bit more to, um, uh, and then you would have less turf grass. So I don't know how we can um, encourage people to do that. I know certain cities, like if you drive to St. Ferndale, for sure, you see a lot of native planting in the front, um, but everybody loves their turf grass. Um, I don't know how many people have got a fair amount of their lawn, how many people have about as many plants as they do turf grass? Okay, well, that, I try, that wouldn't help a lot. Um, and then rain barrel, you can 
catch the water off your eaves and then use it at a different time. For cities, um, they could have curb cuts. I don't know why they don't do this. It's very simple. It would look like the sewer thing right here, but it would just be a cut in the curb so that the water could go uh, into the soil. Um, use the street as a detention pond. So as I understand, a retention pond and a detention pond. And I always think if you give a lawyer a retention, are you gonna get the money back? No, but if you detain someone, they're gonna get let go. So if you're on 16 mile and you're passing by Rochester on the Northeast corner, I think you have what you call a retention pond. So water stays there pretty much. And they've tried to make some of that um, retention ponds along um, right here on 16 mile, right? Sterling Heights, they dug out the sides. They're doing that on mound now, south of M59. And uh, so I had heard that in Gross Point, they were putting sewer covers on with smaller holders, holes so that the water didn't go down that fast. And I thought, well, that's pretty amazing. You're using your streets as a um, detention pond. And I was at a meeting with some um, of the Warren City officials and I mentioned it and the lawyer laughed at me. Well, I don't know, I'm not sure. I'm gonna have to go check that out. Uh, so Biosphere swales are pretty much like rain gardens except they use stones as they head for the um, sewer, permeable pavers. Uh, I've seen this in other states, but they don't seem to be very popular. to let the water through uh, pavers and add retention ponds and detention facilities. So the city of Warren um, built, I think it was uh, an 11 million gallon um, retention pond, detention pond. And it's near Nine Mile, and I think it is Hayes, a nine and it's nine and a half in Hayes. So it's, uh, it used to be an elementary school there. So the problem with trying to do that is trying to keep up with climate change, because climate change yeah. makes the storms more extreme. So when we have a storm, they may call it a 500-year storm. 500 year storm or a 100 year storm, but in reality, it's going to be happening more often than that. Can um, I just, yeah. Can I point out that almost all of the, so, so my name is Julie Matuzik, I'm a township trustee here. If you circle the library and the Civic Center parking lot, you will see examples of curb cuts, uh, bile swales, permeable plate pavers, uh, all of what Park is a like you said that detention right. location when it floods. Uh, the same with Fernhill Golf Course. But when we redid this whole area, we really took a lot of that into account. So even if you walk around the library, you see all the bile swales uh, mm -hmm. that surround the library. Yeah, there's also a yearly conference. I think about that. Do you remember the name of the conference? I know I've been to it twice. It's extremely interesting, very interesting. Um, so this is a, a picture that I came across and I was actually very interested after we had a large flood. Tell me when was this? 2021, wasn't it? 2021. And so I started trying to look into what actually happened here. What I do know in the Detroit side of it was that at the um, kind of, Connor Creek uh, pumping station that only oh, two of the pumps of the six were not working. So I mentioned, mentioned it to someone else in the Sierra Club. That's too bad that you know they weren't working something bad. And she said it wouldn't matter if all six were working. It was just simply too much water and it was going to get out of there. So um, this is the Southeast Macomb Sanitary District. And you can see, I think if you were in Harper Woods, you probably wouldn't have got hit. But if you were in Gross Point on this side, I know people who, who had a lot of flooding there. I'll tell you what, if you could understand what's on this map right here, 
you would probably understand a lot about sewer systems. So where the watershed is and where the water lands doesn't necessarily mean which sewage treatment plant it goes to. But um, at the end of Nine Mile here is the Chapton Retention Treatment Basement and Pump Station. And this part right here is a combined sewer. So that's not, that's not, that's all in one pipe. Since it's in one pipe, if you have a bad storm, you have all the water from everyone's house, you have all the storm water and you cannot treat it. And there's an only, you can't, where are you going to put it? Obviously you put it in the lake. So they had a proposal to expand this so that they could hold more water. As they understand, it was turned down. Uh, I know one other thing that they do is they are using the pipe itself for retention. So I think they have a 12 foot pipe and now they're putting in these um, sections that they can open and close and use that for retention too. Um, and then this one right here, uh, the Martin drain, I imagine the same thing will be going on here. Uh, this is pretty interesting, the Milk River. I've heard the Milk River before. Uh, the daylight's right here. Do you guys know where the Marshall Bar is? <laughs> behind you can go to the bar with your kayak, and then you get right in behind the bar and you go kayak all the way out to the Detroit River. Um, so anyways, I wish I knew more about it. Uh, we happen to have the largest freshwater delta in the world here uh, at St. Clair River Delta. Most of it has developed, and I'll have a few slides about where you can actually go see and enjoy it. And it wasn't until yesterday, after using the slide for two years, I noticed this. What is this? An algal bloom. So I had inadvertently taken a beautiful slide of our watershed with an algal bloom. Uh, so this one is from Lake Erie, gives you a little idea. Another one from Lake Erie. And of course it's toxic, stayed around. Here's something that's close, that's pretty interesting. This, I don't know if this ditch has a name or not, but it starts from right behind the Comcast building, Van Dyke, and then it goes, and then connects right here with the red run. So they had this whole thing. Actually, what you can do right now, I do the pointer, is you can come up here on Shanger and there's a gate and you can come in and walk and bike or whatever you want. Has anyone done that? Yeah. And I, I understand that they're starting to daylight the pipe going this way too. Okay, so I was there when this was happening and I'm gonna show you two pictures. Um, first one from right here, and then where the red run and this new daylighted ditch is going to be. Here's the pipe right here. And the only thing I have a question here is why are they taking off topsoil? And topsoil is a big issue with me because at construction sites in Michigan, they've been allowed for years, scrape off the topsoil, and sometimes maybe the homeowner comes in, why are my trees not growing? Well, they took the topsoil and you need to put some more in. But uh, this was that ditch and here is where it joins the red run. Obviously, it looks like it's overflowed. I wonder what this looks right, like right now. So they used drones and they dropped plants in and I haven't seen it lately, but I'm sure they put a lot of native Michigan plants in and you can see that they have um, very deep root systems that would help them retain water. Here's an example of someone with no turf grass and someone with less turf grass. Um, and of course our native plants support our native pollinators. And sometimes I think we think of bees as pollinators or butterflies, but it's actually anything that will land on one flower and go to the next flower. So, and this one, it happens to be a fly. So next time you hit a fly, you're killing a pollinator. Okay, uh, back to this right here. Uh, this part of the marsh is still intact. And if you come around it, do I have the address here? 
I thought I had the address, but oh yeah, it's right here. Uh, you can come around the back of the marsh and you can go along the walkway. And um, so what I'm going to do is make a big plug for Detroit Audubon here because this is an, a Detroit Audubon, um, uh, what am I trying to say, a uh, tour that I went on. And this is the leader right here. So this was the first time that I had seen someone with gaiters on uh, because of the ticks. So I usually put my socks over my pants because the ticks, it's not getting cold enough anymore to kill the ticks over the winter. So we're having many more ticks than we used to. And I always say, if there's deer, there's probably deer ticks. So um, that gives me a little bit of alert here. Um, so I've got the address in case you want to write me. I was also at another Audubon event on December 27th, and it was the Audubon Christmas Count. And this has started in the 1900, actually in 1900 was the first Audubon Christmas Count because there was a tradition that the hunters would gather together and split in two groups and have a contest of who could kill the most fowl and the most free animals. And they noticed that the counts were going down. So in 1900, they had the first Audubon Christmas bird count. And we are at a farm on Grosseal. And you'll notice the date that the farm started. It's July 6th, 1776. It's the oldest continuous in one family farm in Michigan. Uh, so this was the public part of the event. And then after the public left, the people who really knew what were going actually did the count. So my event bright said that, that the event was at nine o'clock was actually at eight. So I showed up and they had all left. So I followed their footsteps. I'm rushing along from them. Guess where I found them? Back in the parking lot. They were already back. So I did that forced march for nothing. But uh, they generally don't. Um, to take a picture so when i've been on these i've taken the picture and they have a magazine called the flyway so the people who really know what's going on one two this guy is probably the most famous guy around for birdie three uh four five six and then there's everybody else so uh we went on oh i thought i put a couple more pictures in there we went to um, a few places afterward. I said, well, since I didn't, didn't actually manage to get here, uh, can I go on you guys with the official count? So we went to a couple other places on Groves, but be able to count. So this one is um, this woman right here. Oh, uh, so I think that's her. Uh, it's the same one in the last picture. And this one was at the Port Huron State Game area. And it turned out that we had two excellent birders here. And that was this guy. And if I can, I think it's this woman. Oh, there she is right there. One, two. So we had two excellent birders. And so we went on this, this walk and they actually had a contest. And they were going to find a bird that the, before the other one would. So on my telephone, on my cell phone, I always text myself the names of the birds. And the one that they were really looking for was the uh, Louisiana water thrush. Of course, to me, I'm, I wouldn't probably be able to pick one of them out, uh, but they do. Uh, speaking of climate change and birds, the uh, excuse me, National Audubon has a website that you can choose bird and you can choose the temperature. So at the current temperature, the bobolinks range is here at 1.5, which is what we're shooting to stay at, the range starts getting to be less, at two degrees less, and at three degrees almost non-existent. So the changes on the animals and nature itself, which we think are trivial, are very serious. And it's too much heat, <laughs> too much cold, too much rain, not enough rain, too much carbon dioxide, extreme weather, and you keep on going and they're really sort of taking it on the chin. Another thing that happened to me was at a meeting again in Warren, 
Um, Warren, if you see the city hall, you know that big glass facade on the front? So I asked the people at the meeting, how many dead birds do you pick up? And they go, oh, let's see, let's see. I forgot. He goes, hey, Joe, did you, did you ever pick up any dead birds? Oh, I think we had two pigeons. You know, I'm like, what's going on here? You would think that, well, it turned out that the same glass they put in to keep the sun out also kept the birds out. But the type of glass that they recommend now is glass that's dotted like this. And the reason is that one of the species of birds that get killed a lot are hummingbirds and they can get through little spaces. So even this kind of slat or this kind of slat, they can get through. So this was in the new Superior Township Library, uh, Bird Friendly Glass. Um, so where was this picture taken? It's a trick question. It wasn't, it's not a picture. Uh, so there is an artist, uh, well, I don't know if he's an artist or what, but what he does is he takes, um, you know, if this was a little brighter, you'd be able to recognize the city because I think this is the, um, oh, I can't think of New York. Uh, so what he does is he takes out the background lights at night and he just puts in stars in as though there were no lights. So, um, as I said, I got involved with um, Belle Isle um, and Dark Skies, and they got me very interested, well, not very interested, but more interested in astronomy, and especially in the launch of the James Webb Telescope. Was anybody up watching that on December 25th at 7.06 a.m.? Well, it was really, you look at the videos, them making this thing was astounding. And then, of course, there were something like over 300 things that could go wrong, and none of them did. So it's parked right here uh, in L2. So these Lagrange points are places where you could stick a satellite and it's going to stay there. The gravitational pull of all the, of the Earth, Sun, and Moon will keep it right here. It does go in ellipse because the back is, it follows the Earth around like this. The back then is aimed toward the Sun and it's taking pictures that way. So here's a comparison of the pictures between Hubble and between James Webb. And the James Webb is 10 times more powerful. So no doubt some discoveries coming. Uh, this is a picture of the lights at night. We have now a, uh, Pittsburgh is a dark sky city. Um, New Zealand is a dark sky country. And there are uh, very much interest in dark sky places. Uh, we have, a, a, I think they call astro-tourism is on the rise. We have three international dark sky parks in Michigan. The first one was Headlands. It's just east of Mackinac. And the woman who started Headlands is on our team. The second one was Dr. Lawless, which is right here, about. And then the third one just became a dark sky, and that's a Keweenaw Mountain Lodge and the Keweenaw Peninsula. So I booked a cabin for two nights and then it was cloudy. So I tried to cancel and they wouldn't let me. Uh, so, but they gave me a, uh, um, a certificate for it. So what we're looking for in dark skies is not more light than you need, uh, aimed only to at the area that's intended to be lit. Um, on a timer, if you can possibly do it, and of a yellow hue instead of a blue-white. So when we went to LEDs, uh, blue-white left uh, behind what was pretty much our historical color of lighting, which was yellow. And blue-white, if you look at the brochure, talks about how it's not as good for birds or insects or people or animals or trees. So, um, that is going to be the toughest thing of trying to make something uh, a dark sky because of uh, the lighting changes that are going to have to happen. Worse, better. Um, so we have one of the largest, uh, uh, Michigan has one of the largest uh, number of uh, amateur astronomy clubs. Um, here's a few right here. Uh, this one, Warren Astronomical Society on the first Monday has meetings at the Cranbrook Institute of Arts in the basement. So you get to go in and look at the museum. 
we're going to be done. And the second I got a couple more slides and that's all. So I did put together a handout and I was going to read some of the ways that you can save water at home, but you probably know. The last one is addressing climate change. I came across this in um, one of the newsletters I read, which was Tree Hugger. So I read Tree Hugger. Um, I read Cypher, which is from Microsoft. I also read the New York Times Climate Forward. Um, I read Smithsonian. Um, it's not all environmental, but uh, quite a bit. And the BBC has articles about that too. But this article said, you want to solve climate change, you can do it three ways. Insulate, heat pumpify, and electricity. And of course, there is no such word as heat pumpify. And my PowerPoint wouldn't take that out. So as far as insulation, um, I looked up on the DTE website today. If you own a single family home, duplex condo, you can have a home energy consultation. Has anyone had one before? Okay, and did you think it was a good deal? It's a great deal. Okay, good. I need it. Saved a lot of money. Saved a lot of money. There you go. <laughs> right. We may not do this for altruistic reasons. We can also do it for money. But I'm just saying that sometimes that's you can only get the only way you can get people involved. Okay. Whoops. Uh, I'm really looking at the real thing here. Heat pumpify. Um, here are some headlines. This was uh, December 2nd. Germans have seen the future and it's a heat pump. Uh, November 4th, Biden dedicates $9 billion to fund half a million heat pumps. 11-8, uh, heat pumps now required for new homes in Washington State and heat pumps take off in coal-loving Poland amid Ukraine war. So heat pump then keeps us from using fossil fuels to he heat our house. And it looks like an air conditioner, and it really is. <laughs> you just turn the air conditioner around and have it run the other way, and you've got yourself a heat pump. So sometimes it can be the same unit, sometimes that they're separate units. Um, so there, this is nice diagram, and I want you to go home and study that, okay? Uh, but they're actually, uh, I can't remember what else I was going to say about them. So when they um, made the, the latest uh, requirements for refrigerants, they actually allowed the heat pumps to go up to 700. So they didn't want to discourage heat pumps at this time. And then electrify, electrify everything that we can. And I have up here lawnmowers. I'm sure if you got an electric, electric uh, lawnmower, you'd love it. Uh, blowers, certainly. No more gas blowers, please. Weed whackers, editors, you can see. School buses are a no-brainer. And you go up to schools and you see the kids sitting on the bus and fumes. I remember going to Gross Point one time and there were a bunch of student athletes standing behind the bus. And I said, guys, you should move. And I went and asked the bus driver, if you ask them, why are you idling the bus? Or if you tell people about this, they'll really they'll turn their car off if they know. It's a problem with education. And the bus driver's like, they're all like that, like, what? Well, there's actually a law in um, the city of Detroit and a few other cities, too, about idling only five minutes per hour. And in New York City, you make money. All you have to do is take the picture and turn them in, and you get a certain percentage of, of the fine. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, seven reasons why internal combustion engine is dead, a dead man walking. EV batteries have a very long life. That I know. I, have a, I had a um, 2010 Prius and the mileage over 10 years went down from like 47.7 to 47.6 or something like that. Uh, EVs are more reliable. And one of the reasons is that an internal combustion engine has about 2000 moving parts and an EV has about 20. Uh, first time I read that, I said, how could this possibly be? But I guess that accounts for uh, the repair. Uh, parts that are not needed in an EV, exhaust system, radiator, starter, alternator, fuel pump, fuel line, fuel tank, oil changes, timing belts, transmission fluids, spark plugs, oxygen sensors, catalytic converters, and more. And I think that's the end.